Hello and welcome to Talk Time. My guest today is Lieutenant General D.B. Shekatka, one of India's best known military minds, former GOC of the Four Corps, uh, which was largely responsible for the border with China, apart from, of course, retiring as the Director General of the Indian Army's Perspective Planning. Currently, uh, General Shekhatkar is the president of the Forum for Integrated National Security, uh, a think tank, and of course, he has been the chairman of the Shekhatkar Committee that was entrusted by the government of India to come up with recommendations on enhancing the country's defense capability <clears throat> and optimum utilization of defense expenditure. General D.B. Shekhatkar, welcome to Thank my you. show. Uh, General Shekhatkar, you know it well, year 2019 is not 1962 when we had that brief war with the Chinese. Uh, there has been a lot of technological advancements in the Indian Army, Indian military establishment. We are a nuclear power. India has one of the world's largest standing armies. There has been a lot of uh, developments. Are you a happy man? Are you comfortable? Because you were in that critical position in the Indian Army that was responsible uh, for planning. Uh, advance planning for the Indian Army? Yes. I am uh, reasonably satisfied and confident also in happier position. Happiness is a competitive term. Yeah. But let me assure you, Chinese know it well. They know it well that India is not the India of 1962. Absolutely. And Indian armed forces are not the armed forces of 1962. I had the honor, opportunity to negotiate with them Absolutely, on this yes. very thing. On and the border meet, dispute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On border dispute. Part of my expert committee part of the negotiating committee, part of the joint working group, and for a, over a period of years we have been. And when you discuss with them off the table, things are different. They are reasonably uh, concerned about India's growth. When I say reasonably means they know for certain India will not attack them. That they are reasonably sure for whatever reason it is. But they are e equally concerned, should they make a mistake of any type, India is not going to leave them. Second point is, and the same on is, they know one thing, that in case there is a border skirmishes or problem along the India-Tibet border, I don't call it India-China border. Yeah. I deliberately India call it. border, I don't like yes. it, but I say that yeah. is your problem. As far as I'm concerned, it's an India-Tibet border. India is quite capable of giving them a befitting reply. In fact, they are concerned mm -hmm. that India should not play a Tibetan card. They've been reminding us. They're concerned about it. Right. And that concern is genuine. No, no, no. When you say India-Tibet border, uh, are, you, are you trying to take this logic that till 1959 when the Chinese occupied, uh, you know, India shared a border with Tibet, not with China. Is that the argument? Why, yes, Is that sir. the logic yes, why sir. you said that? And uh, taking this point, this, we are very correct. Taking this point, you know, 6th and 7th Dalai Lama, he used to rule Tibet sitting yeah. at Dirang. Yeah. I, yeah. I asked them once, look, if this be the analogy, we were collecting taxes. The Tibet belongs to us and not to you. They had no answer to that. I think over a period of time, thanks to during the British time and initial governance of our country without naming anybody, yeah. we made a mistake. We gave too much of uh, predominance to Chinese thinking. We thought we'll uh, negotiate with China, not understanding the Chinese psyche. They and some other, unfortunately, it's a hard fact, some politicians, yeah. some uh, people particularly, they made us believe China is a big threat. Right. China. That now, is the worst thing. Now you have. know, you were a young officer. You first came to the Northeast in 1960. You had to cross the Brahmaputra in the ferry. Yes, sir. Uh, but you came as a young officer in 1962 when you were tasked with the collection of uh, or to look how many people from our side, uh, you know, the casualties. Uh, that was your, it was, must have been a very, very traumatic experience. But let's not go into that. You also saw the emergence of Nagaland in 1963 when the entire uh, Assam was one single unit. Uh, let's not go into that. My question to you, General Shekhatkar, uh, what are you more worried about? Are you worried about conventional warfare? Are you worried about proxy war? Are you worried about cyber threats? What are you most worried about today? In case of uh, both Tibet and Pakistan, both yeah. combined together now, because as per the Chinese leadership, they have said the problem of Kashmir is not only between India and Pakistan, they have become a party. It is the official statement they made. All right. That is one thing. Conventional war, I am 200% sure we will sort Pakistan out if they invite us to do it again. 
we will be able to take on Chinese also if they invite us on the Tibetan plateau or whatever. And there are no reason elsewhere they can do anything about it. But my problem is the unconventional war, the so-called proxy war, yeah. the trans-border terrorism, the shadow war. What we are witnessing in Kashmir today. In Kashmir today, what we have witnessed in Northeast for so many years, what we have been witnessing with the Maoists today, the things. The problem here is, unfortunately, these people who are creating problem from outside are sustained from within. So I think our larger uh, enemy, our bigger enemy is from within. If we can sort them out well and proper, outside influence cannot work. I've been all my life in this part of the, I can't call it a game and this business. Yeah. Unless there is the internal sustenance, no, unless there is internal support, outsiders can never, never, never but I succeed. have to ask you this question right at this juncture, uh, General. Uh, you know, this brings me to the question of Pulwama. When you said we can short the Pakistanis, obviously we can short the Pakistanis. We have demonstrated them on more than one occasion. Uh, our soldiers, the brave soldiers did that uh, surgical strike, came back absolutely unscathed. Now, question is, when you say we have to short out within, at the same time, there is a support, direct support of a nation supporting a bunch of mercenaries, uh, terrorists. Uh, how do you deal with that? You know, because even the Pulwama attack, the Jaisya Muhammad uh, has uh, claimed responsibility. And the Northern Ar Army Commander, Lieutenant General Dillon, has categorically said JEM is uh, a, a bacha of the ISI. Uh, so we all know that. You know it better. Now, question is how to deal with this issue. Do you think, what is your take on that Pulwama attack? Lo losing 40 plus of our uh, soldiers is not a matter of joke. Yes. It's certainly a matter of concern, and we have to think on it seriously. But I am also convinced, I am also convinced, unless there was the internal support to the terrorists who came from Pakistan, this attack would not have been successful. When I say internal support, there are local people. During my time, we identified 243 families in Kashmir, both North and South Kashmir, who have made millions and millions and millions of rupees as their personal yeah. earning because of terrorism. So terrorism has become a cottage industry into Kashmir today. It's a hard fact, but it's a fact of life. Is it only a cottage industry or is it more than that? It is more than that. Cottage industry means everybody. The teachers are getting benefited. The government officials are getting benefited. Politicians, of course, are benefited. Hurriyat conference benefited. You name one who is but, not benefited. But, but, but you see, do you, have we gone wrong somewhere? You know, this strategy of an iron fist with a velvet glove, we have done it in the Northeast. We have been doing it uh, in Kashmir because it's only now that uh, uh, our government has decided to withdraw the security. You take Indian security, you take money from the ISI, you support Pakistan. What's going on? Yeah, that's the point. You see, when I say uh, problem from within, I mentioned about the things, internal things. We had brought Kashmir under control. I was there myself yeah. at the GOC. We conducted the parliamentary election. We conducted the state elections. Nothing, not a single person was injured. There was no violence. Yeah. Came Farooq Abdullah. He became the chief minister. And thereafter, the things started going wrong. What do you attribute this to? Thereafter, other people came in power. They created a problem. So even these people also have somehow or other understood the mechanism how to bleed India. Pakistan, of course, has declared the policy of bleed India by 1,000 cut. Even these people are supporting that policy. When I said we can sort out Pakistan, it doesn't mean that we get into conventional war or we destroy. No, it is not so. Pakistan's internal problems are so many that what Pakistan officially has been doing to India, officially, they've been stating that we are supporting Kashmir, we are supporting this diplomatic panel, international panel. If we can do just 2% of that, just 2%, Pakistan will find it difficult to survive. True. but. Why, why why, can't we call back our ambassador? Why can't we close down the embassy? Why can't we completely ban trade? Why are we importing cement from Pakistan? Why are we importing a uh, lot of other things from Pakistan? Leather, for example, is one item we are importing. We are importing crores and crores of rupees of worth of cement. Why are we doing it? Yes, certainly. Is, 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 is removing the most favored nation status enough? Is imp imposing a 200% import duty enough? Uh, what is your considered thought? I think first and foremost, we should close down all the trade relations. Completely, completely, completely. Across the board. Absolutely. Right. There's nothing, no harm done. You mentioned about closing down the embassy, getting the ambassador back, high commissioner back. 
I've been studying Quran for the last 31 years. Somebody told me, understand Quran. He never told me, read Quran. He said, understand Quran. And therefore, I have some uh, knowledge. Guftugu chalti rahe, baat se baat bane. Keep the conversation on. There may be some way out somewhere. What do you mean by that? When I say, that means... What, what kind of conversation? Are conversation you talking about means, dialogue or are you talking about something no, else? One is the dialogue, dialogue but, but unless you are in touch with the people. But a lot of people, uh, General, uh, sorry for interrupting you, today said that the time for dialogue is over. No, dialogue there may is be a over. strong opinion. That dialogue may be over, but contact is on. Even in Indian philosophy of warfare, they say never break dialogue with your enemy. It is starting from Mahabharata till today. You must be in contact with your enemy to understand what is he up to? Why is he behaving the way? And second thing which I take it from that, ki dushmani laag sahi. Yeah. Let's, let me, dushmani laag sahi, khatma na kije rishta. You may have a number of animosity. Don't break the relation. I, I need a clarity on this uh, for my viewers. Generally, will appreciate that. What do you mean by conversation? Do you, are you today also saying that apart from the tough measures, India should keep the option for dialogue with Pakistan? Is no. that what you're The saying? dialogue will be when we want to open the dialogue not when Pakistan requests for dialogue. And you can open the dialogue, provided in a, you are in a position of domination. That is the meaning of dialogue. Just because somebody has said, some chief minister, ex-minister, but that's our dialogue. But no. today's, you had held such top positions in the Indian Army. You are one of the persons who are still consulted by the establishment for various security-related issues. Uh, my question is, there is a lot of talk about appropriate action, appropriate retaliation on what has happened. After all, this has been one of the biggest terror attacks on yes. Indian soil. Yes, yes. Uh, so we need action. That is the demand, that is the chorus across the country. So at this point of time, a person of your stature is talking about tough action. At the same time, you're also emphasizing on dialogue. First, tough action. And we start begging, then only the dialogue should start. Not otherwise. When I say dialogue, it means the initiative should not be from our side to have dialogue. They should be. And that will happen only when there is a tough action. Secondly, when they are on the brink of breakup total. That is the time. And the international community will then force Pakistan to have a dialogue and to seek some mercy from India. Now, now the GOC there, the top army commander, General Dhillon, he said that now he has given that message. You pick up the gun, you will be killed. And at the same time, very appropriately, the general had said that appeal to the mothers of these youths in Kashmir, please tell your wards, please tell your sons not to pick up the gun, because if they pick up the gun, they will be killed. Now, my, that was my question, that iron fist with a velvet glove. Do you think that didn't work? It didn't work, but it may work. It may I, work. I made it work I, during my time. I made it work here, there. I made it work here in Assam, you know. Yes. You have been there, you have been following the whole thing. Yes. It worked. And today Assam has become a, I will not say totally peaceful, but reasonably peaceful state. It is in the country. Largely peaceful. How it yes. Because we are using hand, hard hitting. At the same time, we are showing, uh, I will not say mercy, but the understanding, the affection, talking to them, reaching out to them. Pakistan is a totally different ball game. So we'll have to be tough, tough, and tough till they start requesting for mercy. Absolutely. That is one thing. Absolutely. But General Dillon says he's right. He's appealing to mother because the average age of a terrorist throughout the world, throughout the world, is about seven years. Somebody can live for 40 years, somebody can live for two months. So why do the mother want to kill their children or see the dead body of their own children in such a young age? Absolutely. That is the appeal to the mothers from this side. Absolutely. Don't ask your children. Absolutely. On this note, we'll go for a short break. Stay on. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I am in conversation with Lieutenant General D.B. Shikatka, the former Director General of the Prospective Planning of the Indian Army and currently President of the Forum for National Integrated National Security. Uh, General Shikatka, you know, you are one of the persons, uh, you have been saying that, you know, India needs a lean and efficient army. Uh, in 1997, uh, when you were heading the Policy Prospective Planning Division, uh, you brought about a reduction of troops by as much as 50,000. Uh, you know, and, and you had to brave a lot of, let us be frank, a lot of resistance within 
because people wanted to maintain status quo, nobody wanted to close down, nobody wanted to downsize, etc. But you did it, and your, uh, your suggestions were taken very, very seriously by the government of India. Uh, now, do you still maintain that? Because, uh, you know, I'll ask my follow-up question, but first I want to know whether India needs a downsizing of its troop strength. Certainly, certainly it needs. And my philosophy is that, that time General Malik was there, my chief, and when I was in perspective planning, yeah. and we discussed the whole thing. We went to the finance ministry, and they say, you try and reduce one soldier. You just explained to us, can you reduce one? And then my chief asked me, how much can we reduce easily without him? They said, to what, a lakh plus. He said, are you sure? Are you gone? No, wonky. I said, no, sir, yeah. we'll do it. We'll do it. And then we started working on that. And that's how we identified 50,000. It was suspended in emission, which means you start working with deficiency. Unfortunately, and of course, as you rightly said, there were two, I made too many enemies that time. People, if I was available to them outside, they would have sorted me out well and proper. But then I came to Assam as a GOC 4 core, and Kargil came in between. 99. So instead of reproducing 50, we added another one and a half lakh. Added. So we have been reacting, reacting, now, and reacting. At the end of the day, the Shekhar Committee report, at the end of the day, you are of the view or rather, I mean, from the public domain, I'm saying this, that you can reduce up to 80,000 troops. And if you do that, you save the establishment 25,000 crores annually. And if you reduce personnel from the civilian defense uh, companies and establishments, you can add five to 6,000 more. That means if you reduce 80,000 plus people, you are saving 30,000 crores annually, which can go into modernization technology upgradation and the living condition of the soldiers can improve. That is what is your contention. Do you stand yes, by sir. that? I stand by it. I stand by every word which I, we have written there, the committee. Philosophy is obesity of number had never won the war. A lean, slim, trim, proactive and not reactive armed forces or army will produce the results. You can have another 15 lakh added to the Indian army. But if you are not allowed to work, you will be still be in a receptive mode. That is one point. Second number thing is, to sustain the army or armed forces of about 15 and a half lakh, yeah. we have eight and a half lakh civil population, seven and a half lakh. And about 17% of them are sitting in air-conditioned hall, in air-conditioned cars. They're part of the defense establishment. Yes, sir, they are all paid from there. So my, our recommendation have been that not only the army, by 2035, we should be able to reduce 2 lakh 35 combatant soldiers. Yeah. And at the same time, by that time, if we start today, under 2 lakh from the civilian establishment, gradually, and nobody needs sent home. Only thing is, as and when they retire, you don't enroll the things and start working with that. Utilize the same money for development, for modernization. But, for but the, the Chinese are trying to trim down. They have? The Chinese are trying to trim yes, down sir. their army. Yes, sir, you're right. They kept a watch on us. What are we up to? Americans are trying to do it. There are a number of army in the world, but we don't need to worry about them. We no, should worry no, about no, our own. No, no. What is the status of the Sekatkar Committee report? If I'm not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 65 to 70 of your recommendations are supposed to have been accepted by the government. Uh, the, but uh, have they been implemented? No, the implementation the the is underway. Thanks to the present chief of the army, Indian army, General Bhavarat. He is taken it seriously. And of course, the government, it has been, the, the report has been approved by the government of India. It is not by any service as such. The recommendation which are under implementation, I will say they are low-hanging fruits. Low-hanging fruits waiting to be yes, picked. Yes, sir. I, hmm. The reason being, what is not acceptable to the powers that be in the memo D, they are not allowing. For example, but yeah, sorry. DRDO, Defense Research Organization. There's a scope for reduction. Ordnance Education factories, Corps. Education Corps, Ordnance Factories. The MOD itself. The signal code of signals. Code, they are, that they are doing, they have started. Signal, EME, ordnance. The they electronic are and uh, mechanical uh, code. Are, they are doing it, they are doing it. But they are all within the army. There is a similar scope in the Air Force. But, 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 is, but uh, what is the response of the Indian Air Force and the Navy? There must the, be... Uh, the Navy, of course, is saying that we are a growing arm. Everybody is growing. We cannot reduce. No, we cannot do it. But that's all right, that is okay. Air Force has a recommendation. Instead of, in case Air Force, instead of asking for accretion, more forces, they should be able to manage from within, yeah. from within. Yeah. As far as the Indian Army is concerned, there's a scope for reduction, gradual reduction. Okay. Gradual reduction. But, for, but 
you have to clarify this. This is not going to weaken the Indian military in any way, what you are recommending. No, sir, no. 100 percent no, because the reduction is not in the combat force. Reduction is not in the combat arm. Because you are not recommending reduction in the infantry or artillery. Not at all, because we need them. Mm -hmm. And I come back to the one point. If it comes to a showdown with China, only infantry can produce the results supported by artillery and the aviation. Yeah. That is the ground reality. Yeah. So you cannot, and mountains yeah. eat away manpower. So we are not in position. Second point in the connection with the same way. Yeah. If suppose <coughs> that there is a showdown in Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, the world forces will join us. When there is a war on Himalayas, no country in the world, no country in the world the, can send even one soldier. Yeah. We and, are on our and, own. And, and, and technology won't work in the it high Himalayas. Work. There are limitations. So therefore, there is no point of reducing the infantry, artillery, to some extent, but engineers. But many will ask you, what happens if there is a two-pronged war on two fronts? No, we should be able to take it on. If we are not, then there is something wrong. At the same time, let me clarify, because the same point came earlier also. If India as a nation lands up in a situation where you are fighting simultaneously with two enemies at a time, something wrong with the government, Absolutely. governance, diplomacy, politics, bureaucracy, the rules to this we are, state. We are, we are quite sure that that is not going to happen. It will and not of happen. course, the general is not talking about reducing the strength of the combat forces. On that note, to go for not a short break, stay on, we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm still in conversation with Lieutenant General D.B. Shekhatka. Uh, General Shekhatka, your Northeast experience, uh, you know, you're saying that uh, insurgency has not ended, but situation is more or less, you know, under control. Uh, now, do you think uh, that we, there is no scope for complacency? We are in talks with uh, several of the underground groups. The Naga underground groups talks are at an advanced stage. The two major groups are in talks, and SCNIM, we have been talking for more than 20 years, and SCNK has just joined the dialogue, once again joined the dialogue process. We are in talks with one group of the Ulfa. One group is uh, outside, of course, you know it. Uh, so can we be complacent? Is there any scope for complacency? What is going on in Pakistan? Do you think the Pakistanis will try to have an, set their eyes in the Northeast as well, given a chance? Yes, they will. And the Chinese will be too happy to help them, or either way. You mentioned about Ulfa having the things. They still have their roots in Kunming. They're there. We all know it, where they are. Their money is there. So therefore, to say that insurgency in Northeast has come to a grinding halt, it'll be a totally a stupid idea. Unfortunately, in Delhi, there's the environment if nothing happened for two months, oh, everything is all right. right. Everything is hunky-dokey. And that is where we get caught. There is a saying in Manusmati and Chanakya Niti that even a small token of fire, if gets into thing, it can create into fire. If you are left with even small token of loan, without paying everything, it can come into things. And thirdly, any remaining element of the enemy and the animosity will destroy you at some time. And therefore, Northeast, when people say everything is hunky-dory, no, it is not so. I know it for certain. We should not give up because people, that is the mistake we have been making in Northeast. That is the mistake we have made in Kashmir. And that is the making mistake we have done in Northside also. The moment there is a similarity because of the armed forces, yeah. the paramilitary forces, and the other police, state police, when they, there is the upper hand, they start crying and we start beginning weak. Now, now uh, for, for only for lack of time, I'm shifting from one question to another. You see, this tendency of calling, it, calling out the army, you know, at the drop of a hat, where the police and the paramilitary are quite capable of dealing with a situation, but you have got into this habit of, okay, army ka bulao, you know, call out the army in aid of civil power. So uh, how do you look at this trend? Because Northeast, you see army called out for X, Y, Z reason, and you see, you see troops uh, manning bridges and guarding roads, uh, this is not the job of the army, technically, You're because we have sufficient right. number of paramilitary and the police. You are absolutely right. But saying some thinkers, again, sitting in air-conditioned office in Delhi, they think because the constitution said, we may, it, there's a provision. But that is under exceptional circumstances. Yeah. When your nation is about to break up, the things are about to go wrong. Today, what has happened, just because we may, so you do. You press the button and you tell the army. And today, the involvement of army, with all my respect, I mean no thing. Rescuing a boy from a tube well 
till dowsing the fire in the Arunachal Pradesh or Uttarakhand. Yeah. That is the role. And plus, in between, you have to do your own job, guarding the border, taking care of the insurgency, taking care of it. Because people think, people have lost confidence, unfortunately. Even a small railway bridge falling down in Bombay, you need the army to come and construct the bridge. That is a dangerous sign. Let me show you. This is a very dangerous sign. When people start losing faith in government, in governance, in internal security mechanism, nothing, nothing, nothing can help the nation. It's a very dangerous sign. When people start believing on the involvement of the army, the army ko bulao, wo kuch na kuch kar denge. That's a dangerous sign. We do it. Of course, we have to come to the country. We Absolutely. Can't, because yeah. that's the large sword. But does it doesn't mean, doesn't show that they have lost hope? It is happening in the case of police. People have stopped using it. It was the CID they lost, and they went to IB, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, CBI, and today see what is happening there. So people are, if people lose confidence in governance and government, who can save them? Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, it has been two decades since you commanded the Corps, which was largely responsible for security along our uh, borders. You say, you call it the Tibet border. I'd like to still call it the India-China border. Uh, you know, but today we have, uh, you know, the advanced landing ground. Seven of them are already operational. More are likely to be operational. Then you are in Guwahati, uh, basically, for a very interesting uh, uh, track two uh, seminar, uh, basically, on underwater domain. My question is, we have this huge river Brahmaputra, and we have several bridges on top of that connecting to Arunachal Pradesh, etc. See, these are vulnerable targets. My question is, do you think we can tunnel the Brahmaputra from underground, do you think that is a security need of the hour? Yes, sir. It is very much so. You mentioned about Brahmaputra. Today only I'll, I mentioned the seminar. Barak and Brahmaputra, if we can manage the water and the habitat along the river, 50% problem of Assam will be over. There will be so much of prosperity, economic development, right. and so on. Coming to the, the construction of the bridges on tunneling. When I was a co-commander, that time I recommended twice on inland water irrigation time, that there's a high time we start thinking of tunneling Brahmaputra. We even identified certain patches where it is possible. The reason being, somebody will say, no, 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 bridges are there. Bridges can be destroyed by air. Yeah. Somebody can put a RDX once again. It has happened in the past. They did all, they destroyed bridges in Kashmir. So therefore, it is high time for so, us. So are you saying that this should be part of our infrastructure along the Chinese border? Yes, sir. It's part of, so it should be part of our China strategy. Quite right. It should be part Tunnel of China, Brahmaputra. China, Brahmaputra. Uh, even uh, I would say to some extent, if possible in Barak, there is a scope. We have done the study. And particularly in Upper Assam, there's a scope. We have it, the technology? We have the technology. Indians have proved their worth, sir. They have worked throughout the world. We, have we can the, do it. We can do it. We can do, do a lot of things. Uh, General D.V. Shekatkar, for lack of time, only I have Thank to cut short this conversation. Thank you very much Thank for you. being on my program. Thank you so much, sir.